Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global community. Um, this is John Farrar, I'm the CEO of Nimble, and today's a special day. Uh, today I'm here with Michael Brenner, and we're gonna talk about how to create content marketing strategies that deliver massive ROI, or should I say Michael's gonna talk about that, and I'm going to be writing notes and listening. So Michael, let's talk about you for a second. Um, so I met Michael because I believe that you should be teaching and preaching on a daily basis. And I like to preach and teach from people who inspire me. And Michael has been inspiring me, uh, uh, not just in marketing, but also just as a human being for some time. And through that interaction with me sharing the content, we started a conversation and we became friends. And we're not just friends in marketing, we're friends in some of the personal sides. I actually helped build Michael's ancestry tree and uh, brought him back to the 1600s in Germany. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. Mm -hmm. We're here to talk about the fact that Michael is an amazing teacher around marketing. And he's gonna share with us the expertise that he's developed as a global motivational speaker and writer, Huffington Post, Entrepreneur Magazine, books. Um, Michael's got the credibility. I don't need to belabor it. Uh, Michael, say hello to the audience. Yeah, thanks so much, John. That's, that's so nice of you. Um, yeah, hey, everybody. I'm super excited. I am definitely wearing a suit and tie even though you can't see me i'm i you know i shaved and i'm all buttoned up ready to go uh no seriously i'm i'm really excited to share with you uh with all of you guys some of the my thoughts and and experience and and the tips and tricks and real stories of real people like you who are showing massive roi by focusing on content and storytelling and really looking at adding value for your customer so so i'm looking forward to getting started here Fantastic. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll briefly just say that I've been in the relationship management business all my life to help pioneer uh, CRM and contact management for before Outlook or Salesforce existed. Got back in the business to do it with Nimble because I believe that relationships are key to your life success. And with that, Michael, take us away. All right. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. So just really quickly, um, we, we shared this out in the invitations, but just to, to kind of reiterate, we want to help um, help you all understand how maybe not just how, but also why we need to redefine marketing um, and redefine it in the perspective of marketing as a business asset with real value. And I'll, I'll show you some examples and visuals around that. Um, today, modern marketing organizations all need to instill the role of content marketing um, and, and not content marketing uh, from the perspective of we need more content, but content marketing that's truly mapped to delivering value at each stage of the customer journey. So we'll talk through that. Um, I'm gonna show you just a couple of really simple, practical, useful tips um, that I hope you can all take away. Um, if, you know, my goal is to give you at least one, um, but because I need to hit all of you and some of you already know some of this stuff, I've got more than one in here. So hopefully you'll all be able to walk away with at least one. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna use actually stories to tell uh, and to show you the power of stories. And those stories are gonna support the main objectives of this webinar. So um, we'll talk through a little bit about how to, to engage your audience through storing, storytelling. Um, and then ultimately, you know, the only true way to rally your organization and scale value in marketing today is by tapping into the experts inside your organization. So we'll talk about how marketing is, as uh, um, I think one of our, our uh, uh, one of the technology CEOs once said, um, I think it was, I think it was Hewlett Packard. Um, it was either Hewlett or Packard said that marketing is too important to be confined to the marketing department. So we'll talk about how we can rally your organization around the customer journey as well. Michael, right. before you go to the next slide, I just want to interject. Please yeah. ask questions in the questions box. We will be compile answering questions as we go and compiling them to answer them publicly uh, to the audience at the end. Yeah. The other thing too is, um, thanks for that, John, is you're going to get these slides. I, I have a lot of slides and I move quickly to try to keep everyone engaged as much as I can. Um, so if, if I'm moving a little too quickly and you wanted to capture something, um, we're going to be sharing the slides. You're going to get the recording. So please don't worry about that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to move too fast, I hope, but, but we are going to move quickly because <laughs> um, we have a lot to cover. So here's the topic again, how to create a content marketing strategy. No matter where you are on the journey, 
um, that's going to deliver massive ROI. So uh, just really quickly for context, I think it's important to understand that disruption is happening at a faster pace than most people think um, and most people realize. In just the last 15 years, we see more than half of Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. That's a lot. That's more than half. And, and I think we sometimes forget that disruption is happening and it's getting quicker. So in 1955, you see the average company lasted about 75 years. And just in 2015, it, the average life expectancy was 15 years. So, you know, if your company's 20 years old, you're doing better than most. <laughs> you're doing better than the average company. And I don't think most of us realize that, uh, that disruption is happening and it's happening at a faster pace. Now, I like to gratuitously use this picture of my kids on this lovely vacation to tell the story of just how quickly and how recent this disruption has started to, to uh, evolve. So here you can see my daughter there who's holding up sort of her, her hand, making a peace sign at some point. Um, so she turned 16 uh, just here in May, but a year ago she turned 15. And I got an email from LinkedIn, our good friends over at LinkedIn that said, hey, LinkedIn is 15 years old. You know, help us celebrate our celebrate anniversary by sharing a picture of what you were doing 15 years ago. And I showed it to my wife and we laughed because she obviously wasn't going to share a picture of what she was doing 15 years prior. And um, but it just made me think and made me stop and realize, you know, I can't believe LinkedIn is only as it's only as old as our oldest daughter, that it's only 15 years old. Um, it just feels like it, it was around longer than that, that we've had social media um, longer than that, that LinkedIn, the first commercially viable social media platform, feels like it should be older than 15, but it's not. And, and you know, my daughter can't drive a car yet. She just started with her license or her permit. But at the time she couldn't drive. And I'm like, you know, it's it's that young. Uh, relatively speaking. So then I looked at my other kids, that's Ava there on the top right, and um, sure enough, she shares a birthday with the first ad and the global launch of Facebook. It, it started a, a year or two before that with college universities, but the global launch and first advertising was sold on Facebook in 2006. Um, Twitter was launched in 2006. John and I actually connected on Twitter not long after we both joined. Um, but, you know, that's my, I barely leave her home alone. She just turned 13 in March. And and so she just became a teenager. So Facebook is just barely a teenager, if you think about it that way. Um, sure enough, I looked at my son and, and uh, also found another correlation with a, a, a technology that we all use today, and that's um, smartphones or having the internet you know, in our pocket walking around with us every single day is just only 11 um, or, you know, at the time um, when I looked at this, you know, he was just turning 11. So now going on 12 years, so 11 and a half years um, it, since we've had an iPhone or had smartphones that that we've been able to, to take the internet around with us. Um, you know, YouTube didn't exist 10 years ago. Netflix didn't exist 10 years ago. Pandora and Spotify didn't exist 10 years ago. So think about all these crazy technologies that we use every single day that didn't exist just a decade ago. Now, this is my son, uh, number four. Um, he, you know, he's a, he's an interesting challenge for us, and we're trying to figure him out in the same way and and how he correlates with the birthday uh, or the founding of Snapchat. That's a little bunny ears and and rainbow puke filter that I threw on him. But the point is, um, digital social mobile technologies are so much more recent than I think we all realize, and yet they've had a profound impact on the world that we live in. Today, we're all connected to each other. We're all the most important source of information to each other. And, and this has had a dramatic impact on marketing. No function in the business has been impacted more than marketing. So another way to say this is your content has to compete with GIFs of babies and kittens and puppies. And this is not one of my children, but um, I love this picture because this beautiful, cute baby shows every human emotion in about six seconds. You know, he's scared, he's happy, he's sad, he farted. I think he's hungry, he's excited. I don't know what's going on. Um, this is my favorite GIF in the world. And if you have a better one, please share it with me at Brenner Michael. But this is a cat uh, wearing a shark costume, riding a Roomba, being chased by a duck. And I want you to think about the last ebook that you created or the last email campaign you sent out or the last digital display advertising that you implemented and think how well does it compete with that? That's the challenge that we face in marketing today. So I like to say marketing has a marketing problem. And what I mean by that is when I asked my mom, hey mom, what do you think marketing is? You know, she said uh, it's an ad in Times Square, a billboard in Times Square, or it's a Super Bowl ad, or it's an ad of some kind. And some people might say it's, you know, some form of promotion, or other people might say it's propaganda, it's insidious, it's lying, it's companies trying to convince me to buy something I didn't want or need. And so marketing has a bad reputation. 
by most people. Marketing has a marketing problem itself. And I think it's a little meta, uh, I, I realize, for, for, a, for a Thursday uh, here in the United States. But, but you know, the point is that I think we're responsible for the reputation that marketing has, the bad reputation that marketing has. John, I just pause just for a second and see, what do you think of that marketing has a marketing problem? Too meta or do you, do you agree? No, I 100% agree. I think that sales and marketing have a problem. And I think it really all started with mass manufacturing, which led to door-to-door -door salespeople and madmen marketing in order to uh, move the products out that they are mass producing. And I think that social media is transforming us to a small village where your reputation is built on the promises you make and the experience that you deliver. But yet today, I think that too many salespeople want to bag and tag customers and too many marketers want to uh, interrupt you and, and trick you. And I think that n the new marketing is storytelling. I think that people don't buy great products. They buy better versions of themselves. And we got to stop talking about ourselves and our products and start talking about how we can help people grow. Yeah, no, that's great. I agree. I agree. Cool. All right. Um, so I... Normally in a live audience, I'd ask people to raise their hand, but but just think, maybe just think in your in your own head. Do you know who the CMO of Coca Cola is? So see, Coca Cola is you know the world's most recognized brand in the world. Um, you'd think you'd know who the CMO of Coca Cola is. Well, guess what? Two years ago, the CMO of Coca Cola um, uh, actually retired, and Coca Cola said, "You know what? We're the world's most recognized brand. Um, I don't think we need a CMO." So instead, they put a uh, salesperson that was actually the head of their North American sales organization um, over responsible for marketing, and um, which is you know kind of interesting. And and they they titled him the chief growth officer, which is ironic because their sales are down two percent worldwide and seven percent in North America. So the chief growth officer, it's kind of like he got to the elevator on the 95th floor. And, you know, the entire company and all of his customers were in the elevator and he got in and he said, everybody going down, uh, going up. And they said, no, we're going down. And, and that's kind of what happened, I think, with the chief growth officer. He was asked by AdAge what he's going to do with their marketing. And he said, well, in order to make people love Coca-Cola, we just need to show ads of people who love drinking Coca-Cola. This is just to me the perfect example of the marketing problem that marketing has. Um, bag and tag, I love that line that John just used that salespeople like to use. Those days are over. The days of just showing happy people drinking Coca Cola and that's going to drive sales of Coca Cola clearly hasn't worked. It clearly isn't working anymore, and it's getting worse in their in their home markets of North America. And that decline is going to start to spread around the world. So so marketing has a marketing problem as evidenced by the lack of a CMO at the world's most recognized brand and this perception by their now head of marketing. This is not just one brand, it's true for all CMOs have a bad perception of marketing. They're unsatisfied with the job that CMOs are doing and it's only CMOs. It's not COOs or CFOs or CHROs or CIOs um, where CEOs are 20% unsatisfied with them. They're 80% satisfied with the rest of the C-suite. They're 80% unsatisfied with the job of the CMO. But if we ask CEOs what marketing should do, the answer, you know, you it's the typical stuff. They want leads, they want revenue, they want some sort of business value, maybe even return on investment. But when I ask most CMOs what their ROI is, um, in fact, it's 100%. 100% of the CMOs I've asked have no clue what the return on investment is for their marketing. Okay, so we all understand we need to show ROI, but you know, I think that what happens is sometimes we look at the org chart and you know, the org chart kind of gets in the way. The CEO, you know, maybe you get a new CEO and he says, I don't like blue, I like yellow. Um, and so the whole marketing organization gets spun up and starts thinking about hiring an agency and thinking about a rebranding project just because the CEO doesn't like blue. And you look at the sales organization and they're always asking for brochures and pens with logos and stress balls and, you know, centrally located LED lit, you know, really expensive, amazing booths at the industry trade shows. Um, we're in marketing. We like to create stuff. So we've got Instagram and Snapchat and promoted tweets and Facebook booths. And maybe you're doing a podcast with my friend Jay Kunzo or animated explainer videos, or maybe you put your company's name on the, on a billboard on the side of a highway or a banner on the side of a website. This is Cambridge University from two years ago, 2000 university students and not a single one looked at at the banners on the side of a website. But this is, you know, this is the stuff that we do in marketing today. Now we even have HR. HR is saying, hey, we need to recruit some really good looking, nice, smart people. So can you create ads talking about how, what a great place to work we are using pictures of really good looking, smart, <laughs> diverse people. Um, so now even HR is asking us to do stuff. And, you know, we've got the CFO and the COO keeping costs down, asking us to comply with new procedures. 
everyone around the organization is asking for more stuff. And at the end of the day, what does the CEO ask us? Hey, what's the ROI? And so this is like the, the literal rock and a hard place that I think we're all, um, well, it's not really literal, right? It's not a literal rock and a hard place, but this is the metaphorical rock and a hard place that we're all stuck between in marketing. Um, this is serious decisions. You may have seen these numbers, but I, I use it every time I can because it just shocks the heck out of me. 60 to 70% of the content created by organizations goes completely unused. This is crazy, 56% of campaigns listed in a CRM system at, with the objective of, of generating demand or creating leads don't produce a single lead. That means you want to find leads, you wanna generate demand, and you don't generate any. You can't find a single lead with 56% of your demand generation campaigns. The point is the majority of what we do in marketing doesn't work. Now why? I kind of gave you the answer with some of the visuals, but why do we do all this stuff that we know doesn't work? Well, I think, you know, it's this grumpy old white guy's fault. Uh, he's just he's just a mean guy. And, you know, behind every bad piece of content or marketing campaign or any marketing thing that we do that doesn't work is an executive who asks for it. It's these mean executives that make us do the stuff. And I think you maybe you laugh and maybe you you know maybe you cry. I'm not sure, but the point is I think it's easy to point the finger at mean people and and you know the the, the org chart and executives and say they're the ones that made me do it, but we're the ones that do the stuff and and we're the ones that create the content that doesn't get used and we're the ones that execute the campaign. So I think in order to change the perception that marketing has, we have to start taking accountability for what marketing is doing. So. You know, I guess the question, and again, it's a little bit meta, but do you like working in a profession that people hate? Um, and if you do like working in a profession that people hate, then you probably won't learn much from this webinar. But if you want to work in a profession that has meaning and value and impact, well, I, I, you don't have to wait for the CEO to make a change. I think we can all make the changes that are required to start to redefine what marketing is. So, but it, it requires a choice. And so, uh, this is really the, the fork in the road. Do you want to help to change it? And that means starting to take a new approach to marketing. The way that I, I like to define content marketing is it's the overlap between what we typically create and what customers are looking for. And, and you know, I think on the left-hand circle, it's all the stuff that we typically create. It's the stuff that doesn't get seen or used. It's, it's who we are, what we sell, why we're better. And that promotion and propaganda, you know, it's, I think, important to understand it's our natural instinct to talk about how great our products and services are. Unfortunately, that doesn't overlap with what your customers are looking for all the time. Now, what your customers are looking for sometimes looks like paper pictures of babies and kittens and puppies. So we need to find this overlap. And I think the overlap is more in what we call content marketing or maybe thought leadership or maybe you have other names for it. But it's content that helps your customers. And it's usually based on on expertise and passions and and unique um solutions that you have not quite at the product level at the sort of the higher level and that requires empathy and i know empathy is sometimes an overused word in today's environment but but we really have to actually care about people so let me give you an example ge is a customer of mine they sell mri machines and ct scanner machines and they love and th these some of these machines are even beautiful to look at they love to talk about their machines their audience the people they're targeting are radiologists and guess what radiologists care about they care about how much money they make. They care about how much school they have to go for. They care about where they're gonna get a job. And so what GE did is they, we created a radiology, radiologist and radiology technologist salary guide to answer the question that radiologists have, the most important question, how much money should you be making? And that was a risky move for GE, but you know they did it in order to help the audience that they're trying to reach. And that's kind of what content marketing is all about. But what do you do when you've got mean executives who have no empathy? How do you convince them that they need to? Well, we got the answer from Jerry Maguire. This is a little sped up, but you know they got the answer. <laughs> show me the money. We got to show them the money. We have to think more like business people and less like the creative marketers that maybe we want to be all the time. Um, and so here's the line I want you to use when your CFO or executive team asks you why you want to do content marketing. Content marketing is a digital asset with real value that grows over time. This is different from advertising, which is not a digital asset. And it has maybe some value, but not value that grows over time. Whatever value you might get from advertising drops to zero the second you stop spending money. That's not true of content marketing. And so this is what I wanna show you. We have to start by building the business case, and I'll show you a visual of 
the value of content marketing here in a second. The business case is to reach, engage, convert, and retain buyers you would have never reached using the keywords that your buyers are using, creating the content that they're already engaging with, and then converting them to sales and retaining that engagement into a higher lifetime value. That's really what marketing is all about. And that's what content marketing can do. It's a digital asset with real value that grows over time. So this chart is a combination of 12 different client examples, all of them in different industries. Mostly, I wanna say 75% B2B, um, there was a B2B to C company that was a, um, a insurance company that sells to businesses that sell insurance to consumers. Um, there was an e-commerce company. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of companies in here, but the trend for them was all the same. They spent a small but consistent amount of money on content. And that content didn't provide a linear rate of return. It drove a compounded rate of return. This is like your 401k or a retirement account if you're not here in the United States. You spend maybe 3% of your salary into your retirement account every paycheck. Not 95%, not 100%, just 3%. But that 3% doesn't return the same amount back to you in with a little bit of linear interest. You get compounded interest because the first dollar or pound or euro or whatever you invested, it starts to it it, it generates a return every single day. Just like the first article that you publish generates traffic every single day for if it's evergreen for the lifetime. Um, if it's if it's more timely, it may need to be updated. But the point is, you're getting an increasing rate of return. And if you can then convert that traffic into leads or into revenue, you can see a compounding rate of return. Content marketing is a digital asset with real value that grows over time. Now, um, one of the ways we're seeing this reflected is on corporate websites. You know, 20 years ago when corporate websites were launched, they were basically printed brochures that moved online. And they talked about who you are, what you sell, and why you're better, and how how good looking your executive team was, and where they went to school. But now we're starting to see those kinds of websites are seeing declining traffic. The majority of corporate websites are seeing a decline in organic search traffic because they talk about the things that no one cares about. But some websites are starting to make a change, and they're generally using this concept of stories. GE puts stories on their homepage where they talk about things like how wind turbines can save the planet. Uh, Microsoft talks about how technology is, is empowering students around the world. Um, we see Chase Bank is using news and stories about financial education to try to engage people that are interested in financial education. They took off their 5% cash back offer for a new credit card to talk about how you can understand your credit, credit score or why it's a good time um, to buy a home in the winter. And the reason they did that is because from 2012 to 2014, this is SEM Rush data, uh, but it was verified by my friend Brian Becker, who used to lead this program. From 2012 to 2014, Chase Bank saw flat and actually a slight decline in their organic search traffic. In 2014, when they launched stories on their homepage, they went from 10 million monthly visitors to 25 million monthly visitors. The red line there is paid. You see, they don't spend a lot of money on paid because why would they when they're seeing 15 million new and an increase of 15 million new visitors every single month that are engaging with their brand, who they can then ultimately in line in the content that they're sharing, offer up 5% cash back offers to credit cards. And so now Chase Bank is a thriving, growing brand on their website based on organic search traffic because they tell stories their audience is interested in. So the I think one of the first things we need to think about is marketing needs to be committed to focusing more on customer interests. It's not enough to who to know who your target audiences are. We need to understand what they're actually interested in. And so a quick example, if you if you do a Google autofill of marketers are, you'll see most people think marketers are liars. But when I looked at the data in my Google Analytics, it said the marketers are interested in TV and entertainment. And the most popular TV and entertainment show up until Chernobyl last week was Game of Thrones. And so I wrote, what are the seven things that marketers can learn from Game of Thrones? Um, the most important thing, by the way, is to kill your hero. Um, but my point is that I looked at what marketers were interested in instead of trying to speak directly or find marketers based on their persona. And that's just an example of what you can do. Now, I was at SAP uh, a number of years ago as their first head of content marketing. 
And with a very small amount of budget, because we had never done it before, focusing on delivering value through customer-focused content, I generated a platform um, or created a platform that generated um, nearly a 7x return on investment. It was the highest ROI marketing program that the company had ever seen and was a real um, feather in the cap for our CMO at the time as well. And so when I left, I took the opportunity to write this book called The Content Formula. And I'm not actually pushing or promoting this book. That would be counter to the message of this webinar. Um, the problem is I, I documented the 10 formulas and calculations that anyone could use to show the return on investment with marketing using content. And the problem was I handed that to a bunch of prospects and leads and CMOs when I left and went out on my own. And I went back a couple of months later and they had all read the book, but none of them had implemented content marketing. And what I found was that the formulas and the math isn't enough. They needed to implement a change in their culture. They needed to talk to those mean executives who were asking them to do things that didn't work, but still expecting a return on investment. So this is my promotion. Now I'm promoting myself. Um, I actually, believe it or not, no one owned the domain meanpeoplesuck.com. So you are now listening to the proud owner of meanpeoplesuck.com. But that's the name of my new book coming out later this year. But I'm going to talk about how empathy leads to success in marketing, business, and life. And it really talks to, through how we need a culture change. And that culture change doesn't need to start at the top. It can start with you. And so, you know, look look for, for more information on that book coming from me later. But let me tell you a story of someone who isn't mean, who doesn't suck. This is Amanda. Um, and I want to just give you an example, a great story, I think, of somebody who's implementing the power of empathy. Amanda's the senior director of content at the Cleveland Clinic, and she's a resident in Cleveland, and she used the Cleveland Clinic with her two kids. And when she joined them as a marketer, she was told, hey, you know, every life deserves world-class care. We're the best provider of world-class care in the U.S., and we're number one in, in heart surgery, and we've been number one for 13, 14, 15 years. And Amanda, you should create banner ads and press releases that talk about how awesome Cleveland Clinic is. And Amanda thought, you know, that just doesn't ring true for me. You know, like I love this hospital system. The doctors are amazing. The administrators are, are easy to work with. The, the nurses are out of this world and I've had the best experience. I think we should talk about that. And so Amanda actually realized she needed to change the culture inside the organization. So she created this video internally called the Cleveland Clinic Empathy Video. And it talked about how if you could stand in somebody else's shoes, would you treat them differently? She believed that's why Cleveland Clinic was better or different. And it was just a series of vignettes that showed the different people that, you know, in the different scenarios of what happens inside a hospital, you know, and they're, they go from sad to happy to horrible. And, you know, this guy was, you know, dreading this appointment, fears he waited too long. And this poor couple, their 19 year old son is on life support. And this woman, she's waiting for a new heart. And this woman doesn't understand the treatment options for the diagnosis she just received. And, and this poor girl's visiting her dad for the last time. And now I'm going to start to choke up. But the point is that Manda used this video to convince their executives of the power of empathy in marketing. And they actually changed their entire mission statement to improve people's lives, whether to improve people's lives, whether you could become a patient of ours or not. And so that that change alone is pretty amazing. But what Amanda did with it is even more just just fantastic. And 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 so I'm, you know, just love sharing this story. She created this site called Cleveland Clinic's Health Essentials, where every single day for five years they shared patient education stories with the world. And and what happened when she started this in in April of 20, um, I think it was 2013 now, um, they started with just this idea to do one article a day, and they've done that for five years now. And they went from zero, from absolutely zero, to five million monthly visitors. So if you're thinking, oh, I can't start creating content, there's so much noise out there, there is the, the healthcare category is the number two most searched for category on the internet. Amanda started from scratch, from zero, five years ago, and grew to a site that has five million monthly visitors. And she did that just by focusing on patient outcomes. Um, she used this as a tool called BuzzSumo, where you can type in a website and see all of the content and how many social shares it gets. And she has an article that has 65,000 social shares. I bet most of you and your entire companies combined don't have 65,000 social shares. Amanda did it with one article. She's got articles with 57 and 55 and 47 and 45 and 42 and 46,000 shares. And the list goes on and on. Um, in case you're wondering, 
what the color of your urine says about you. I know this is a question on all your minds. She created an infographic about it. And it's a funny story because she said, she's like, you know, it used to take us four, law, four law, lawyers and 55 um, uh, doctors to create any piece of content. And now we're creating infographics about what the color of your urine says. Um, if you're curious, this is the infographic. Um, and if your urine has these colors uh, in it, uh, you need to go to the hospital right away. But the point is they're even having a little bit of fun uh, with serious healthcare content. Um, and 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 breaking through the sort of resistance that you might expect in a regulated industry. So if if Amanda can do it, if the Cleveland Clinic can do it, if the healthcare industry can do it, you can do it too. And this platform drove revenue. Uh, more she can't really give numbers out, but she said it was multiple times more revenue in the form of partner advertising than the platform costs. And so the the lesson I want you to learn is that publishing frequently drives results. No matter what data I can put in front of you, the trends are almost all the same. So that's Amanda's number, that was HubSpot data, this is my 12 um, combined uh, client data. The point is that when you focus on frequency, you see results. It's one of the simplest tricks and tips, and it's why um, one of the services I offer is, is it just a two to four weekly blog service, completely outsourced. We do all the SEO, we do the keyword optimization, and we just you know, just sort of take it out of your hands and start generating high quality um, content frequently. Um, and, I, and I kind of use this quote from Mark Twain, where he says that, you know, we don't have to sacrifice quality for quantity. Deadlines are the greatest source of inspiration. And so it really starts with making a commitment to a frequency. And that's why we asked that question when we got started. So, so publishing frequently, frequency or frequently or committing to a frequency drives results. All right. So, um, what if we and how can we redefine the role of marketing? So uh, a quick example of that, this is Jill Curry. She's the CMO at JLL, which is Jones Lang LaSalle. They're a commercial real estate company. And I got to meet Jill um, when she had just been named CMO and she said to me, you know, I asked her how it was going and she's like, our ads are ignored, our content isn't being used, our campaigns stink, our buyers are all looking for help. She was with the company 14 years and led their sort of customer advocacy programs and she knew the help that they were looking for. And so Jill decided to redefine what marketing meant for their organization. And what she meant was that marketing had always focused on product and sales. They used product marketing, advertising, demand generation, and, and tried to deliver their marketing through content and campaigns. But Jill believed that marketing was too important to be left to the marketing department, like I said. And so um, the way she thought of herself was as the chief storyteller. I'd love John to kind of maybe comment here, but basically what she said is we can still do product marketing and advertising and demand generation, and, but we're gonna focus on customers. We're gonna focus on telling stories that engage our customers in the form of content marketing. And I'm the chief storyteller, not just of the marketing organization, but for the whole organization. And this was how Jill redefined marketing for JLL. And John, you've just you know been in the industry and such a great thought leader. I'd love your thoughts on this sort of picture of modern marketing. Well, Michael, I, I've built two global technology technology brands by telling stories and getting other people to tell those stories at scale. And I think that CEO doesn't stand for chief executive officer. It stands for chief evangelist, evangelical officer. I think that it really starts top. And I love the fact that 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 she is focused on storytelling. And I think it has to go across the entire organization. I think that 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 we limit marketing to marketers and sales to salespeople, but I think that the entire organization is involved in sales, marketing, and customer success. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so I, you know, again, this this is a model that um, you know I'd love to see implemented in more places. So maybe maybe John, it starts with you and I and the folks on this webinar, and and maybe we can make this make this a, a reality in in more places. And again, you know, the key points, and John said, I think you said it so well, with chief evangelist or, or you know, evan, evangelist um, as the CEO is, it's awesome. I mean, it, it marketing is just it's just it's bigger than the folks in marketing. It's bigger than content. And campaigns, it really goes across the whole organization. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you know some of the ways that that Jill shared with me. Um, 
you know, she looked at the Pixar storytelling formula, which is something you guys, if you haven't heard of, um, there's an online course you can take. It's a simple couple of steps that that you can use. You can even get certified in it. Um, Jill gave that training to her team, um, focused on really tried to focus on telling stories that would resonate with their audience. Um, she used this, uh, you know, great example from Red Bull and the guy that jumped out of that, uh, um, you know, the spaceship and came down to Earth. And, you know, just as an example of a company being bold and really taking a leap, um, you know, forward from from what their marketing, excuse me, what their marketing used to be. Uh, you know, Jill's comment was that we have so many smart people in our organization. I want to turn them into storytellers, and she she even used the word I want to create a movement here at JLL of of building this team of storytellers. And she did it. Um, and the way she framed it was, this is good for you. You are you're an employee here at JLL. You understand commercial real estate. You know how to solve some of the problems. Maybe you're in sales or customer service, or um, maybe you're even on the back end, and and you understand certain problems that no one else understands. And share that expertise with the world you know that we're trying to reach and and she used some data this is data from linkedin that showed that a company's employees have 20 times more followers than the company's social media accounts and so you know the power of the mass of employees is 20 times greater than the power of anything the brand can do you know in and of itself um another stat from uh, this is from talent connect that showed that 30 percent of all the clicks on branded content come from three percent of your employees and so if you think your employees don't care about the content you create, they do, and they're out there sharing without you even really trying. And so just imagine what would happen if you went and asked them what kind of stories they'd like to share, or even ask them to create the stories that you'd like to share or they would like to share. Just imagine the power, um, uh, you know, and, and that can generate higher reach, engagement, conversion than any paid media program ever could. Um, and so what Jill did in, in short is she built a team of storytellers across the whole organization it not only drove a massive increase in return on investment for marketing, it also turned JLL into this amazing place to work. The people that are there are happy to be there. And LinkedIn even mentioned them as one of the best top 50 places to work in the entire world. And all thanks to the effort that Jill made on activating their employee storytellers. Um, one of the quotes that Jill gave me in the conversation we had was, we're all in marketing, we're all storytellers, and we all have the power to influence our buyers. And I just thought that was really an inspirational line that maybe we could all use in redefining marketing. Okay, so so let me just, you know, take a step back and, and you know, maybe where I started in the disruption that's happening. We live in a society where the majority of our of our colleagues and maybe some of you are not happy with our jobs. According to Gallup, the, the new numbers are actually 33%. So there's a slight 1% increase in the number of employees that are engaged in 2018 versus 2017. 50% of employees are disengaged. 17% of us are actively disengaged with our brand, with, with our employers. And, you know, I don't know what that means exactly, but I, you know, I just imagine people stealing pens and pencils and breaking their computer and calling in sick all the time on purpose, you know, actively sabotaging the objectives of the company. And so it's a crisis of engagement that this the technology disruptions that we're seeing is causing. And, and the majority of us are really unhappy in our jobs. So part of the reason that I, I wrote the book Mean People Suck is to try to answer the real problem behind this lack of engagement. And it comes back again to the org chart. And I know we think of the org chart as, you know, sticks and boxes and lines and we throw people inside those boxes. But the problem is, you know, we're not just boxes and lines. We're real people, and I think that can be reflected here. I found this this cartoon on the real org chart, which I think is pretty funny. Um, you know, and it shows you know maybe a, an org chart where the CEO is sleeping with somebody five layers down, and you know there's a bunch of people that have secret crushes and hate each other, and people that are afraid of each other, a bunch of people that golf with each other, and secret resentments and affairs and old scores, and some kids that you know uh, some people whose kids go to the same school, and there's a drug dealer, and there's a threesome, and there's religious connections, and brothers, and married couples, and jealousy, and I mean, all of these things that happen inside every organization, because every organization is made up of real people with passions and desires and faults and, and you know, all of the things that make us human. And yet we forget the most important person to our company. The only reason companies exist is because we're serving other people. We're serving customers. But where is the customer represented in any org chart? And so that's one of the problems I'm trying to solve and mean people suck. But I, I want to give you the answer. And, and I came up with this really simple, basic uh, visual of what an, an org chart with the customer at the center would look like. Um, it's quite literal. And I call it the bullseye. It, it's an organization that focuses on delivering value at every level um, across every function 
for customers and understanding how important customers are across the entire organization, not just marketing, but sales, customer service, operations, finance, product, HR. My wife loved to point out that legal's upside down in this image. And I said, that's, a, that's a, on purpose because lawyers don't give a shit about customers. Um, and I do know a few lawyers that might care, uh, corporate attorneys that might care about customers. But the point is, how do we get everyone on board with this program? And so the best way I can try to show this is to give you uh, an example, a story of someone who did this. So this is Lily Lepine, um, and she was the digital marketing manager at Capgemini uh, a couple of years ago. And when I met her, she said, you know, my my goals, my my performance review metrics are to show return on investment for marketing and to increase the reputation and awareness of our of our experts, or in their case, it's a professional services company, they're consultants. And so she, you know, was asked to do things like create tweets and press releases and and um, marketing campaigns that talked about how innovative their consultants were, and that's how Lily tried to drive value for their marketing organization. The problem was Capgemini was number four in brand ranking against these well-known brands, KPMG, Deloitte, and Accenture. And so their CEO looked at KPMG, Deloitte, and Accenture, and he saw that KPMG, Deloitte, and Accenture like to sponsor golfers, and they like to golf, uh, sponsor the LPGA, and they like to sponsor golf tournaments and anything that had to do with Tiger Woods. And, and so what do you think the CEO at Capgemini thought Lily and her team should do? Of course, he thought they should sponsor a golfer. And the CMO, who was a golfer, um, she wanted that golf sponsorship budget. It was like $20 million, I think, is what Lily told me. And that's a lot of money. And so every CMO in the world would want that $20 million budget. And Lily said no. Um, she, it, instead of following the lines and the boxes of the org chart, she pushed back up and took a lot of courage to push back against that. She looked around the organization and she looked at their customers and she said, what's in it for the customer to sponsor a golfer? And she went and she did a survey and she found 17% of their customer base was interested in golf. Only 12% of them actually followed golf regularly. And so she mentioned that to the CEO and CFO, CMO and said, if we sponsor a golfer, we're missing 83% of our audience. And so what's in it for the customer, even for those that we're reaching, they're just gonna see our name on a golfer's hat or see our name uh, in Golf Digest. What's that gonna do to increase our brand awareness or elevate our experts or show a higher return on investment? And so Lily went, she did some research and she found that their audience was doing again, using BuzzSumo here, was looking and engaging with a lot of content around the kinds of technology consulting projects that they were involved in. And she used this tool, so this is one of my tips. Answer the Public is a free tool that anyone can use, and Lily used this one. Um, she went to Answer the Public, she typed artificial intelligence in, and it gave this beautiful mind map visualization of all the questions that their customers were asking. And so Lily thought, how awesome would it be if we answer these questions, what's in it for the customer for us to do this? Well, the value of that is huge. It's massive, way more than if we were to sponsor a golfer. So Lily put together a proposal. She said for 0.1% of the cost of a golf sponsorship, I think I can achieve all of the goals you have set out for me in marketing, and you can hold me accountable to a million visitors, a million new visitors to our website. That was her proposal. And luckily for her, she had a, she actually had a really amazing CMO and a really supportive um, chief executive officer who said yes. And sure enough, after a year, she she achieved her result and they stumbled upon a million dollars in sales. Now it gets a little bit more interesting um, because a million dollars in sales is amazing. And every one of us would probably love a marketing campaign that generated a million dollars in sales. Um, so Lily looked into the data and she found some interesting insights. But at the end of that year, the CEO still thought maybe they should sponsor a golfer. And the CMO still wanted that $20 million budget. And Lily pushed back again. And because she said, look, look, I looked at the million dollars we sold. And what I found was that we sold that million dollars because of the articles that were published by our experts. And so they created a little module on the right-hand side of their, um, of their platform called Employee Connect. And so uh, if you think about uh, you know, a guy named Joe, who's a consultant and uh, an expert in artificial intelligence, writes an article about the six things you need to know about artificial intelligence, and there's a little box next to it that said, connect with me on LinkedIn. And that's what Lily thought would be awesome. And so she said, hey, give me double the budget, 0.2% of the cost of a golf sponsorship, and I can use this employee connect module, and I think I can double awareness and sales. And she did way better than that. The most successful content marketing platform I've ever seen generated $24 million in sales in just its second year with less than six-figure, well, a, a low six-figure budget. 
And the reason that worked is because Lily pushed back against this natural instinct to want to promote the company in the same place as the competitors were, to spend all this money on a golf sponsorship. And yet Lily looked at the data and she saw that their customers were asking questions and that drove value. And when she looked at that value, she saw that the value was coming directly from their employee experts. And so she activated those experts and she doubled down on that and it created more than double the value, $24 million in sales and massive return on investment. So um, I'm coming to the end here and we'll open it up for questions. Um, just quickly to review, you see Amanda and Jill and Lily all focus their content on customers. They built the business case for success. They committed to frequency and that drove exponential results. They built a team of storytellers. They map content to the buyer journey and they're able to dis display, demonstrate, show the value of content marketing ROI. Now you may be thinking, hmm, I think all three of those are women. Why are there females only in Michael's examples? Well, the answer, and I talk about this in Mean People Suck, is that women are 40% more likely according to research, and it's multiple studies and, and multiple uh, um, uh, cultures, if you will, from traditional to even more progressive. Women in general are just 40% more likely to display empathy. And you know you can come up and cook up your own thoughts and ideas as to why. But if you're a man and you're out there thinking, I'm not sure if I have empathy, well, then you definitely probably don't have any empathy. So my advice is to go find a woman that does. But the, the point is that I'm making a joke is we all are born with the capacity for empathy. We're all, we kind of lose it over the course of our lifetime. We start to think that maybe our job is just to listen to the boss above us and to do what we're told. But if we're gonna change what marketing really is, we have to start to push back and focus on delivering value for our customers through empathy and focus on the empathy that we need to have for our employees, our colleagues as well, and think about how we can lift them up. So my, my final point is really that, you know, I've told a few stories, but you're the hero of this story. Only you can help to drive the change that we need in marketing to start to deliver the value that we can, that I know that we're capable of to get our whole team on board at putting our customer at the center. So that's it for me. I'm going to turn it back over to you, John, I believe, and then we'll get to some Q&A. Okay, great. Um, so Michael, number one, that was fantastic. I was just uh, screaming booyah the whole time. <laughs> And the thing that really resonated for me was if you put your customer at the center of your journey, make them the hero and, 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 and encourage your entire organization to be focused on what they can do to make that experience better and to help that customer grow, then you can't help but grow. And I have a story for that. There is a company called Defiance Milk and they were a powdered milk company in New Zealand. And they, um, this was like in the eight, late 1800s, and there was a lot of powdered milk companies ha back then, and they, they were all struggling to get a piece of the market. Well, somebody um, essentially was uh, collecting letters from moms inquiring about how to feed their babies with the powdered milk. And so basically the, the CEO hired this nurse to answer the questions, and eventually they compiled that uh, into a book and that book outsold the Bible. It was a, it was a book on how to basically take care of your baby called the baby book. Oh, and wow. ultimately that defiance milk company became GlaxoSmithKline, the third largest pharmaceutical company in the world. And so this isn't really anything new. Companies have been doing this for some time, but I think we all got lost in this interrupt marketing that we do. And so your stuff really resonated with me. And with that, um, I'd love to answer some of the questions that we have. Do you have the list of questions from the doc that we shared with you? If not, I'll go ahead and ask the questions to you. Yes. No, okay. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, so here's here's a few questions from Claude Walton. He's been busy back there. Uh, what are the stages that Michael likes to use for the B to B or B to C journey? Oh, geez. You know, I I had a slide in here on mapping content to the buyer journey, and I kind of took it off because there's so much debate around what does the funnel look like and what are the stages. And, you know, I, I mean, I think there's the easy, you know, early, middle, late is is usually what I think of because I, I hate to almost give them a name. My friend, uh, my really good friend, Andrew Davis, is, is talks about the loyalty loop and how it's not a funnel at all. It's a, it's a continuous feedback loop. 
um, which I love because that gets me back to the definition of marketing I learned in college, which is marketing is supposed to be a two-way communication between a company and customers. Um, but I do think early, middle, and late is is a is the way I think of it. So by early, I think way earlier than any most any company thinks. Um, pre buyer journey. Um, you know, one of the things I love to create is what is content because like what is artificial intelligence for an artificial intelligence company? Because those companies all overestimate the intelligence of of their target audience and don't realize that maybe your champion, the the, the buyer you're trying to reach, maybe he or she understands the thing that you're selling, but she's she's got to convince the CFO who doesn't know what AI is, or she's got to convince the user base who doesn't know what AI is or whatever. So, you know, I like to think of the biggest opportunity being those earliest stages, almost pre-buyer journey. Um, and I like to think of it like journalists do in the form of questions. And the questions are typically what, why, how, when, and where, and usually in that order. Um, and I think when you see marketing strategy, start to think of the what, the why, the how, the when, and the where, um, it massively transforms the content and the campaigns that they produce. So that would be my advice. Again, you can go pick any model, but but my main advice is you're leaving uh, engagement on the table if you're not focusing way earlier than you are today. So Michael, the <clears throat> the funnel as we know it today was built in the 1800s by the French. It was yeah. invented there, and, and I think it's archaic. I think that the funnel is more like a pretzel. It's a journey. And I put into the chat window an article that I particularly like, the McKinsey Customer Journey uh, article. And in there, they talk about the buyer journey where there's a trigger that you go and build the initial consideration set. Then you do active evaluation. And then even after your moment of purchase, you go through a post-purchase experience where you're continuing to evaluate only until you really fall in love with what you've purchased that you get into a loyalty loop where you actually go and buy more and drag your friends with with uh, with you. Yep. Um, so I really dug that one. Um, what tools besides BuzzSumo do you like uh, for upfront audit? SEMrush? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mentioned SEMrush. Um, I mentioned BuzzSumo. I showed answerthepublic.com. Probably the best tip that uh, of, of a tool most people I know aren't using answer the public.com. Um, uh, I also Google autofill. I, I showed that as well. Type in your audience. Like I did with GE radiologists are, and you'll see your radiologists and you'll see they're looking to understand how much money they should make. So just use Google autofill. Google trends is the great, I call it the great equalizer of, of, of disputes. Um, when I was at SAP, we used they used the term SME instead of SMB. Uh, for small business. And I showed them the massive number of people that were using SMB versus SME just using Google Trends. So, you know, those are the ones that I like to use. You can use Ahrefs or Moz um, instead of SEMrush. Um, there's a couple others uh, out there, but those are the main ones that I like to use. And, and again, we're talking about research around what content to create and keywords can, to use. Michael, can you show us the autofill thing that you're mentioning? Just bring up a, like a browser and, and do what you're talking about because I'm not sure I exactly know what you mean. Yeah, sure. So can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Marketers are liars. <laughs> <laughs> marketers are most interested in, marketers are scum, and marketers are storytellers. We have Seth Godin to thank for the first and the last one here. But uh, that's it. That's I didn't even open the browser. That's just Google autofill telling me that marketers are liars. Most people think marketers are liars or typing marketers are liars. Google autofill is the greatest... A research study no one's using. Okay, cool. Um, what's the minimum number of buyer personas in B2B to use for the mapping? Oh, um, so I wrote an article, and I'll forgive me if you're a persona consultant, <laughs> but I wrote an article, it was titled, Personas are great except when they suck. And I wrote that because when I was at SAP, there were five or six different vendors that walked in with these really thick, Bible-thick, persona-based studies and not a, and they were all hundreds of thousands of dollars and not a single one told us what content to create, what channels to deliver it in based on what interests or needs that our audience had. And so I, I don't think it's about the number of personas. I, I actually like to do a mission statement exercise with my clients where I get rid of personas altogether. And it's again, personas are great, but they're only great when they define the main core function of your business. What is, I say, like, go ask your founder, what problem did you start the company to solve? 
um, usually you get a, a much higher level answer than you know we sell widgets and we want to become the world's greatest widget provider. Um, no, the widget maker realized that there was a, a you know a hole in the universe that needed to be filled by widgets. And so define the hole. Here's another tip. If you look at the Pixar storytelling formula, what you'll find is that a, an hour and 55 minutes of a two hour movie are all on the problem. It's only the last five minutes that are focused on the solution. So it, it's not, I'm not saying get rid of personas. I'm just saying you probably have too many. You probably spent too much money defining the the things that we're hiding from, right? If you know me, no, I'm 47, I live in Philadelphia, I'm hiding from you as a, as a consumer. I don't want marketers to know who I am and where I live, and I don't want marketers to market to me. I'm hiding based on my demographics. But guess what, I love Game of Thrones, and if you know that, you might ha find a way to get into my heart. And so those are the things, focus on those interests. That would be my advice around personas. Okay, question from uh, James Climb. Should we focus on creating content for pain or is it better for pleasure? Oh, I pain. I, I say marinate in the pain. Um, <laughs> a, a, every every great movie and story is is awful, painful, you know, heart wrenching. You know, we we meet someone that we hopefully like, and we find that they're going through a struggle. Marinate in that. That's that's what that's the greatest stories compel us to action through through fear and pain <laughs> or a lack of something that we want. Okay. Um, do you have any insight on the role that keyword research plays in content marketing? I still, I just wrote an article about this. I think keyword keywords and SEO are still the greatest business case for doing content marketing and still one of the best objectives for marketing overall. If you're not engaging a new audience or growing the audience you're engaging with, you're dying. Um, I can go into SEM Rush and tell any any company whether their brand is up or down over the last year based on the organic search traffic that they're getting. And that's all relative to the number of keywords they're creating content around. So, you know, what what brands are doing today is they're trying to spend their way out of that problem and you can't spend your way out of it. D does the process you're talking about only work for big companies or will it work for an entrepreneur? It works better for small companies, uh, believe it or not. You can be more nimble. You can be um, less tied to the bureaucracy and infrastructure and, and you know, that org chart that I talked about. And so, you know, break through the mean and the people that suck and get to the value. Uh, comment about a commercial that still sticks with somebody. They said they still love Mean Joe Green and the Child and the Coke uh, jersey. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh Comment from Robin, I love the presentation slides are great, great job, great presentations, R.W. Siegler, thank you so much. Um, what, to manage expectation, is the average start of ROI is 18 months to see real returns of content marketing? In other words, how long does it take once you get started to see some movement? Yeah, no, the 18 months is a good number. I mean, I usually tell my clients, and it was in the, it was in the trends, um, that, uh, uh, you know the trend it, you uh, it, there's like a six month period where sometimes you see the data actually go down and and for most there's a, a little bit of an increase in six months almost all of them almost every client of mine i think every single client of mine has seen an increase at nine months and then the exponential increases start around 12 to 18. so so again invest that dollar every day or whatever the number is um and but but have a little bit of patience like I said, it's it's you know if you think of the trend for ads, you spend a dollar, maybe you get a result, and maybe you don't. But the the second you stop spending, you get zero, you get nothing. That's not true for content marketing. You can stop spending after 18 months and still see results. Got a question from Chuck Royer here. Are you seeing a slight increase in B2B companies beginning to realize the importance of content engagement? What key sources can we use to begin a foundation of creating content that tells stories? and what fits now and ongoing to our customers' interests and needs. Now, there's a lot there, so take your best shot. Uh, I mean, I, you know, again, I go back to uh, storytelling and, and the, you know, there's, I, I was an English literature major, so I studied, studied J Joseph Campbell, who inspired, you know, George Lucas to create, uh, you know, and, and the format of Star Wars, really, and, and a lot of people know of, of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey through Star Wars. Um, but um, you know this Pixar storytelling formula breaks it down even simpler um, into you know once upon a time there was a person who wanted something we all want and every day that person um, you know sought that that uh, sort of goal but but faced a you know an obstacle 
Um, and then one day they were sort of, they were seeing that they saw the light, they see, you know, they, they faced the truth and, and that led them on a journey they weren't expecting into the darkness, if you will. Um, but because of that, they grew as a person and they overcome came those challenges and they transformed as an individual. And until finally they, you know, they reached the promised land. That simple storytelling formula is true of every single Pixar movie. It's true of every single great book that was ever written and every great movie ever created. And, and so that's where I would focus, focus on those simple formulas of storytelling like I said, the one rule is focus, marinate on the pain, focus 95% on the pain and, you know, just that last bit on the solution. You um, know, that reminds me of the book Le Mis. I, I think it's it's just, it's buried in pain and pain just keeps happening, but pain helps you transform. Um, so one last question, how does Serum work with content management? And, you know, it's funny, Michael, you and I were talking about this before we started the webinar. And, and it's my belief that content is is kind of like fishing. It's you're dropping a fishing lure out there and you're trying to get a bite. And the worst thing you could do as a content marketer is not to engage the people that respond to your content. That's the whole point of, of the content is to start connections and conversations and ultimately to turn that into a mutually beneficial outcome ideally you serving them and they serving you and yeah. not all content is about sales i mean you may be doing content to build connections to turn people into storytellers which is what i've done to build the nimble brand so crms are all about turning those co connections and conversations into people and into results what do you think michael no i i agree and and I think we're over time, so I'm actually going to use that as as your segue to get into your into your offer here for for the tool. So for those of you who haven't tried Nimble yet, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's free. You can go to nimble.com and sign up. In fact, we have uh, a coupon here where if you decide to become a customer, you get 40% off the next three months by just using the code JON40. And with that, Michael, how can people connect with you and um, and uh and and ask you questions so you've yeah. got your linkedin there you've got your twitter there and yeah. there's my linkedin and twitter um if i can serve anybody here please let me know my email is jon at nimble.com i'm easy to find um michael this was fantastic uh i really appreciate uh your time and uh and your inspiration yeah, no, thank you, John. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And, and I really thank, you know, appreciate all the folks that joined us. And hopefully you got something out of today. Um, appreciate you guys at Nimble giving us a platform to kind of talk about this. And um, with that, uh, have a great, great rest of your day. Great. Thank you so much for everybody attending. Uh, have an amazing week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.